My name is David Miller. I'm president of the Rhinebeck Historical Society, and I welcome you to our monthly program. Tonight, we have a very special program. I'm here to talk about an amazing collection of nearly 2,000 photos of Rhinebeck from the 1940s and 50s taken by Frank Asher. In 2020, Frank's grandson, Jonathan, donated these large format negatives to the Historical Society. Using our new scanner, it took me six months to create digital prints from these negatives. These 70 to 80 year old negatives are in great shape and the images are remarkable in their quality because of the large format. We have a lot of ground to cover, so let's get started. Okay, uh, first a little bit about our photographer. Frank Asher was born in 1881 and died in 1958. He was born in New York City, but for most of his adult life, he lived and worked in Rhinebeck. This is our hero, Frank. Frank was an accounting honors graduate from the Eastman National Business College. He put that training to use as treasurer of the Rhinebeck Coal Company, which is located in the Rhinebeck Gazette Building, 24 East Market Street. He was treasurer of the Church of the Messiah and for over 38 years, treasurer of the Dutchess County Fair. He also served as New York State Police Justice. In addition to his financial duties, he served variously as vestryman, junior warden, senior warden, and clerk of the vestry of the Episcopal Church of the Messiah from 1926 through 59. Frank's primary occupation, however, was the Travelers Insurance Company agent for Rhinebeck from 1921 through 1958. And in his younger days, he even ran the projector at the Star Theater. So, let's get to his family. This was, I think, one of Frank's favorite family members, Peter, because there are dozens and dozens of pictures of Peter, way more than any other family members. Here's a picture of the two of them. Frank has his eyes closed, so I didn't include it in the, in the collection. Peter does not but at least Frank and Peter are both wearing white. Well, let's get serious. This is Frank's wife, who he married in 1902, Marion Livingston Radcliffe Asher, a lot of famous names from the Dutchess County. They had one son, Robert Wilson Asher. Here he is on his wedding day, on leave from Puget Sound Naval Shipyard. He married Eleanor Strong, another famous Rhinebeck family name, in December of 1944. Here's even a picture of Frank's mother, Catherine Lucy Blake Asher. Now, her husband, Augustus Franklin Asher, ran an ice business on Rhinebeck's Legion Pond, also known as Crystal Lake, also known as Asher Pond. And here is a picture from early uh, late 19, 1800s. Now, Frank loved photography. His most prolific time as a photographer was in the 1940s and 50s. He documented everything that happened in Rhinebeck during that time. He photographed car crashes and fires for his insurance company, parades, the Dutchess County Fair. He took portraits of almost everyone in town, of stores and homes, and many of his photos appeared in the Rhinebeck Gazette. Then he developed and printed them in the basement of his home at 24. Chestnut Street. Frank was very involved in everything in Rhinebeck. Here's a thing, a bulletin board he had in his dark room labeled all licenses. And it's hard to read some of them. This is his, his uh, registration certificate as a voter, his gasoline, gasoline ration card during 1942, other ration books, his press pass. He took pictures for the Gazette advertiser. Another uh, pistol permit to carry a gun, a civil defense permit. Here's another for Travelers Insurance Company. And here's his ID as police justice for Rhinebeck. Frank did it all. Now, what cameras did he use? Here's a picture from 1951 of Frank with his speed graphic camera. I found this picture on Google. It's what it looked like. I had a camera like this many years ago. You had these wooden plates, you pull these pieces of wood out, you slid a negative in, in your dark room, put it back, put it in the back of the camera, took a picture, 
took it to your dark room and developed them. They were very laborious tasks, but these four by five giant negatives yielded amazing quality. Here's his other camera, his Zeiss Icon. He commented that this was first uh, one envelope, and I'll tell you about the envelopes in a minute, was marked first set of pictures with my Zeiss Icon camera from June 1942. So this must be one of the last cameras out of Germany because it was six months after the war started. So here's what I did. Let me give you a quick show of how I, how I, how I converted these images. This is our new scanner. I was able to get four of the giant four by five negatives from the speed graphic or 12 of the two and a quarter by three and a quarter negatives from the uh, Zeiss Icon on the, on the scanner. There's a light you can't see. The lid comes down, shoots light through these onto the scanner board underneath, just like an enlarger. If you put these negatives in the enlarger, you turn on the light, it shoots it onto the photo paper, same way. Here was the magic. Frank had 300 envelopes. And every envelope was labeled with what was in them. Most of them had 20 or 30 pictures in them. And they had the dates. Mrs. L. Hull, 845, Statsburg Residence, New York Central Trains, a freighter on the rocks in Rupert Cove, 42945, three shots of my dining room, and 52945, Junior Hospital AIDS. So I would print two or three of these, uh, copy, copy these negatives, and then I could say, how do I piece these together to figure out who's who? Well, junior hospital negatives, 529, here they are. Three pictures of Frank's dining room, here they are. Here's a freighter on the rocks in Rupert Cove, and so on. I'd match the sheets of negatives to the envelopes, and I'd build a database. And then I would slice them up, and here it is, the junior hospital aides. This picture is nearly 80 years old, and it is phenomenal in quality. How did I identify all the people and all of the houses and stores? There is a Facebook group called Rhinebeck Past and Present of people who live or lived in Rhinebeck. It has over 4,000 members. I posted many of these pictures and can, I asked them, could you please identify these people? And they did. Now it took me hours to process each of those envelopes to build a database and slice them all up. And the response from that Facebook group to the individual images was great. So my challenge for tonight was to figure out how can I show you in one hour, 150 or so of the 2000 images to give you a feel for what's actually in the collection. So I decided to put them into categories. The first one obviously was for his job as an insurance agent. And Frank was very specific. Here it is, it says, C and E Stacks Trucking Company, fire, 1215 AM, November 14, 1943 on Garden Street. And you can see here is the star building in the background. This is now the star parking lot. And people on Facebook told me that after the fire, the C and E Stacks Trucking Company moved to Statsburg. Here are some car wrecks. This is a wreck in the Lloyd garage. I love the old cars. There are many pictures of car wrecks, some serious damage done to these cars. Here's another car wreck, and there's many, many of them. Here's an interesting one, again, for the insurance company. Trucks coming down the hill across the cemetery. And again, crash, b &R Trucking Company, 131 East Broad Street, Frankfurt, New York, Clear, dry road, 9 a.m. Tuesday, et cetera. Very detailed for the insurance claim. Many cars still come way too fast down the hill past the cemetery towards Astor Bridge. Here's another one. This says Harris Milk Truck. And the milk truck again crashed into the tree. And you can see the cemetery in the background with the war memorial right there. Now, the next group. Oh. The next picture is, there's a lot of pictures of uh, 
Lucille and Don Wheeler. It must have been good friends. And it said, car in Don Wheeler's house. I thought Don Wheeler bought a new car. And Frank took a picture of it. No, it was a car in Don Wheeler's house. It was a serious accident. This house was just above the mobile station, heading up the hill towards, towards the village center. And it was a fatality and serious injuries. And again, Frank took these pictures for his insurance company. Here's a great shot. And this again is labeled Gibson burglary, flash picture taken 9 a.m. 22746. This was the building that held the Gibson Company, eventually the Williams Lumber Company. Eventually it was torn down to build Village Hall. So the next group is, is some copies of old photos, some of which I've never seen before. Now, this is a discharge paper from the Marine Corps for Ralph. Odell Haskins. In the 1940s, there were no copy machines. If you wanted a copy of anything, marriage certificate, baptismal certificate, discharge papers, old photos, you went to Frank, put them on his copy stand, took a picture, developed it, printed it. He copied so many things in the collection. But here are the old photos. This is a very early photo. I've seen many, many iterations of this one. It's a copy of something from the late 1800s, before the Rhinebeck department store building was built here. Hogan Cigars and Tobacco Store was here. I gave a talk several years ago about the history of cigar smoking in Rhinebeck, and so George W. Hogan was mentioned in that. Turn 180 degrees, and you have the Beekman Arms, very old version of the Beekman Arms, horses and carriages. Here's the village water pump. Bern Sipoli told me that there were cisterns under the intersection, and people pumped their water from them. And I believe this was the stage that used to take people from the Beekman Arms down to the train station. This building was pointed out by the Facebook group being a few doors up from the Rhinebeck department store on Route 9. And it says tobacco and cigars, obviously, again, late 1800s. It was a picture, I didn't quite know what it was, a gentleman standing in front of a very old car. And it was pointed out to me, this is Vincent Astor. And a car buff gave me a lot of detail for the database that said, this is a Roadster model, such and such. And Vincent Astor had many different ones that he raced and won awards all over the world. And it was great to have that information. And the buildings behind it are the first of three groups of buildings that are gone this group was knocked down to build the bank parking lot. I'm going to have two more instances where buildings were knocked down to build parking lots. Here is the Milroy Brothers Blacksmith Company. And this is on West Market Street, where Mirabu is today. Now, a major transitional change happened to the businesses around 1900. Before 1900, there were blacksmiths, hay barns, horse and carriage, boarding, leather goods stores, saddle stores. It was all about horses. In the next couple of decades, a major change took place. It was about car dealerships, garages, parking lots, and gas stations, like this one. This is the Rhinebeck Garage. This is where today's liquor store is. This is where the Petit Bistro is. And these are some guys very proud of their beautiful old cars. This must have been around 1910, judging the models here. And uh, this is the beginning of cars in Rhinebeck as opposed to horses. Here's the last copy of an old photo. There were many more. I have no idea where this is. Nobody in the Facebook group knew where they were. But clearly, in the late 1800s, this was some of Rhinebeck's finest upstanding citizens. And I love the signs on the wall, old, reliable King Liniment. Dr. Decker's Magic Sarsaparilla, Rheumatazzi, the greatest remedy. In the Gazette Advertiser at that time, there were so many ads for various snake oils. Um, it's just wonderful to see this. No idea where it is. Obviously, something to do with horses because it was late 1800s. Great picture. And there are many more. So the next is people. Okay. Frank photographed almost all of the men in town and some of the women. And he, he wanted you to come as you are. If you were a banker, a, a lawyer, you wore a suit. If you were 
uh, auto mechanic, you wore a Texaco uniform, a barber, you wore a lab coat, et cetera. And here's a few examples of the hundreds of portraits. And this obviously is Benson Frost, his wife, Betty, his daughter, Barbara, and their pony at the 1943 Dutchess County Fair. And here is Benson's official portrait. This picture is 80 years old. And you can see every hair on, on, on Benson's head. Amazing stuff here. Here's a picture of Frank at 26, I mean, of Benson at 26 Mill Street, which was uh, 1951. He's sitting at his desk. And here is 26 Mill Street. It's the former Hallenbeck office. You probably can't read the sign, but it says Benson Frost, attorney at law, Frank Asher Insurance. So that's the connection. Frank lived at 24 Chestnut Street, the Benson Frost house is across the street, and they were next to each other in their businesses. And here is a picture from uh, 1943. It's Benson and the president, probably at a bond rally, a war bond rally in front of the Beekman Arms. Now, a few pictures of some other famous people. The Sipperlis. This is a picture of Carlton Sipperly, who was Peter Sipperly's dad in 1943. Here was a confusing picture. This is a picture of Carlton's brother, Peter and Vern Sipperly's uncle, Vernon DeLake Sipperly, but his nickname was Pete. So when they said there were pictures of Pete Sipperly, I got confused. This is not Peter Sipperly, it's Vernon DeLake Sipperly, Peter's uncle. And here's my favorite. These two pictures are amazing. They're from 1948 on the left and 1951 on the right, a very young and handsome Vern Sipley. And the last time I saw him before he passed away, every hair on his head was perfect, never out of, out of place. And when I bought my house, he did the plumbing, he did put in the boiler, he put in the septic, he came over and he showed me how my house worked, and we had a relationship with him from then on over 20 years. I love I loved Bern, and I miss him all the time. More famous people is Don Haskins. He eventually uh, owned the IGA from 1945 on. Here's a 1945 parade. Uh, Don Haskins on the left, and this is Homer Staley on the right. And I told you before, there were many pictures of Lucille and Don Wheeler. They were good friends. They, they were the, the car accident happened in their house. Um, and this is a picture of him in 1944, dressed in his in his uniform. And of course, several years later, after the war in 1953, here's his official portrait with his mobile gas shirt on. He wanted you to come as you were. And if you look at the rest of these pictures, Three or 400 pictures, nobody smiled. Frank never said, say cheese. For some reason, he wanted them just looking at the camera and not smiling, don't know why. Here are some great pictures from 1942. This is the founder of the Rhinebeck Historical Society, DeWitt Grinnell, working in the pharmacy in 1942, a handsome young man. Some people on Facebook commented, wow, I never knew he was young and handsome. I knew him as an old man when he was president of the Historical Society doing great things around town. So here's another set of pictures in the pharmacy. This was the Rexall Skirmahorn Drugstore. Now a few more samples. Here's Robert Martin. He owned a variety store. He's wearing an apron. George Bravender, who owned a bike shop near Forster's parking lot. Milt Mool, who sold cars at the Chevy dealership, which is now Gigi's. You'll see many pictures of that in a few minutes when I get to businesses. Magnus Reichelt in 1944, a builder. Remember Magnus Reichelt? You're going to see another picture with the name Magnus Reichelt on it in a few minutes. And Bill White. And he says he was an undertaker. 
I live across the street from the Burnett and White Funeral Home. I have to believe that he's one of the founders of the Burnett and White Funeral Home. A few pictures of women. This is Mildred Ziegelbreyer. She became Mildred Young. She worked for Benson Frost for many years in Frank Asher's building. And then when Frank retired, she took over the insurance company and also sold real estate in the same building. Here's a picture of uh, Amanda Ritter in 1945. Call Frederick Sipoli and Peter Sipoli gave me a lot of names. And they said, they said uh, Peter said that uh, she worked for the Hub Garage and was a very good friend of the Sipolis. Here's the last picture, there are hundreds more, but I don't have enough time, of our very own Deb Dows. Sorry for the fingerprints that got in the emulsion. Again, nobody's smiling. And this chair, hundreds of them were taken in Frank's chair behind this white background. We should find that chair and put it in the Museum of Rhinebeck history because it's a very important uh, relic from Rhinebeck's past. Let's move on to the next group of photos, stores. 1944 view of East Market Street. This was the Oneida Market. It hadn't become a department store yet. I love this says Albany this way, New York that way, and the Berkshires that way. Here's still a cigar store, the other drug store, the Rexall drug store, where uh, DeWitt Grinnell worked. Frank took a lot of pictures at night. Here's a picture taken in December of 1947 of the hardware store. I love that store. I miss it. We've left a sign up there, um, but it's no longer a hardware store. Frank took dozens and dozens of pictures of snowstorms. He loved taking pictures of snowstorms. Here's the Star Theater, Foster's, Restaurant and Soda Fountain, and the Esso Station, which is now the uh, Foster's parking lot. Lots and lots of pictures of every snowstorm that ever happened. This is a picture from 1950 of the Dingus Diner, inside and out. Now, if you look at the shape of these windows on the second floor, you can see that this is today's Smoky Rock Barbecue. Frank mentions on the envelope that this was Peter's favorite restaurant. Obviously, Frank was across the street in the law office with Benson Frost, and he used to come across the street, have his breakfast or lunch, and obviously they gave Peter donuts or something. He said Peter loved going to this restaurant. Here's a picture inside of it, soda fountain, and they have vanilla, real strawberry, butter pecan, chocolate, seal test ice cream, banana splits, and chocolate sundaes. Here's the Rhinebeck Diner. You'll see some more pictures of that later in the parades. This is to the left, the south of M&T Bank. It was First National Bank of Rhinebeck, now, now to the M&T Bank. Here's the Fairlawn store on East Market Street. Henry Shattenstein Meats and Seafood. I believe he moved into what today is Thai, the Thai restaurant. And Don Haskins eventually opened the IGA. This picture is from 1951. This is a picture of the Town and Country Supply, no longer a gas station and not quite yet a liquor store. Obviously, in 80 years, many stores have opened and closed in the business district. Here's a picture of Skirmahorn Drugstore inside. This is Uncle DeWitt, and this is Mr. Skirmahorn. Lots of band aids and other drugstore material. Here's another inside picture greeting cards and chocolates. And here are booths where you could sit down and have ice cream. It was a soda fountain as well. And here is the window, velvet ice cream, Whitman's chocolates, which you just saw. And I love her looking over Cody with lipsticks. It's, the window is great, great. So that was Skirmahorn Drugstore. Now there are many pictures of stores, but I'm gonna show you a few pictures that I put together where Frank tells a story. Okay, so here's a look down East Market Street. This is the artist shop. This is Abbas Flaffel. What's this? Building, 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 building. The paint store is the candy store. Coming soon, 
another empire market. This is the second hole that was cut in East Market Street to build the CBS parking lot. Well, the Empire Market and then the CBS parking lot. I noticed these things in the 1950s. They put parking meters and of course, there's a whole envelope full of pictures by Frank saying, first day of parking meters. And he photographed virtually every parking meter in the business district. Here's a zo I zoom in on it and you can see one, two, three, four, five buildings gone and the paint store, which is now uh, the candy store. So that's the first story. Now, in the 1940s and 50s, Rhinebeck had a great tradition. I wish we had it today. They let the businesses, let the school kids paint Halloween windows uh, on all the storefronts. And it's great. And they would put their names on it. I can't read this one. Um, no tricks and no treats at the Hub Garage. This is Vincent Asher, grade nine, which is stirring. I can't really see what stores they are because um, they're zoomed in. He zoomed in on the on the prints. There are dozens and dozens for many years of Halloween pictures in here. Here is a witch and some kind of a goblin, and this says Magnus Reichelt, who was a builder, grade ten. Obviously, Magnus Junior painted this painting. And here is Stickles and a lot of paintings on the front of Stickles as well. Okay, so that's the second story. Now the third story is very interesting. This is an odd picture uh, of a bunch of boys playing music, carrying banners. A Facebook person said this was the day in 1942 that we defeated the Japanese at Guadalcanal, the first American victory of World War II. There was an impromptu parade down Market Street. But what I wanted you to see is the third store, Schaefer store. Some mannequins in the window. It must have been a women's clothing store. So remember, Schaefer stores in 1942. Now, the department store replaced this in the, in the summer of 1949, smoke sale damage going on, tremendous savings, Schaefer's, it's all burnt up, caught fire. There's another detail also in the summer of 1949. It looks like they tried to rebuild it. Frank took this picture and tried to save it. Then they decided not to. They knocked it down to build stickles. Here's the beginning of Board's going up here. Now, someone said one of these guys is uh, Al Stickle, but they couldn't remember which one. And I love the French pastry next door. And of course, a couple of years later, here is Stickle's, the department store, and the Skirmahorn drug store. So that's, that's the third story. Now, the fourth story is interesting. This is a parade from the 1920s from our collection. Over here is Gigi's today. It went through many iterations of, of car dealerships and repairs. This says Post Office Rhinebeck. This is the post office before FDR built our new and current Rhinebeck post office. So okay, this is the 1920s. In the fall of 1945, Frank took a series of pictures. This is now a Chevy dealership and a title gas station. They knocked out the windows. He came back a couple of days later. The first floor is down. Came back a couple of days later, and it's gone. And of course, this is the parking lot now for Montgomery Road too. And a couple of years later, he took another picture, and this is the picture, more looking more like uh, the Jesus of today. So. Here's another picture now. This is a construction of the Rhinebeck Community Garage being built on gas station. Here it's all finished. Another one of Frank's night shots. Dodge, Plymouth, Rhinebeck Community Garage. Where was this? This is where the village parking lot is today. And this was torn down as well, the third opening in Market Street to build another parking lot. 
is we're getting into garages now and gas stations. Hub Garage across the street from the Beekman Arms. Here's the Sinclair gas station next to uh, the Messiah Covered Niver. You can barely see it back there. Here's one of Frank's many snow shots showing the Chevy dealership, the Baptist Church, Terrapin Today, and down by the Messiah, the gas station. As I said, Frank has many, many snow shots in here. Uh, here's one more picture of 1947 of an old restored Maxwell at the Hub Garage. And uh, it's beautiful. Interesting to think that in 1947, they considered a car from like 19 teens to be an antique that needed restoring. A 1947 car we would consider a very old antique. Here's an interesting story um, about a renovation uh, that started in 1944. Here's the first picture of Rugi's. Okay, on Montgomery Street. And here's Oldsmobile Service, service station. Behind it is the Duchess Inn. I gave a talk a couple of years ago about the boarding house of Rhinebeck. This was a boarding house. And then after the great fire that burned down the school building, several grades were held in this building until it was torn down. Here's a picture a year or so later. This, the Duchess Inn is still here. Now Rugi's is beginning to build a showroom that he has today. And this is the back. You can see the school, the emergency fire stairs, kids playing ball, and their bicycles. And here is the wall going up for the Rugi showroom on the side there. Now, we get to the Messiah. Frank, of course, loved the Messiah. I read you all the things he did for the Church of the Messiah. This is a picture um, from 1944, and here it is in 1952 in a snowstorm. Frank loved photographing the Messiah Church in the snow. Here's a picture of the altar. Unfortunately, it's in black and white. And this is, the church has beautiful, beautiful stained glass windows, even some Tiffany windows. And here's an interesting picture. This is today's Miranda House Bed and Breakfast. It's across Route 9 from the church. Why is this here? Because this was the parsonage until uh, in 1943 when this picture was taken. Then they made plans to build the current rectory. And of course, Frank, here's some um, pins put them on his wall, took a picture, chest that's your elevation. Here's the front and the garage. Here's the first floor, the kitchen, the dining room, living room, fireplace, hall, and bathroom. Here's the second floor, four bedrooms, and one bathroom. That was 1945. In 1945, they began construction. And Frank covered it all, give me a couple of samples, digging the hole for the foundation of today's rectory. The rectory, the shell finished. Here's, of course, the church and the stained glass window. Um, the shell's done, all done a couple of months later. All the landscaping is in, all the shutters are on. And this, of course, is the rectory we know today. But Frank didn't stop there. As soon as it was done, he went inside. Here's the couch and the reverend's desk. Here's more of the living room and the fireplace we saw on the plans. Here's a dining table and a lovely silver tea set. Now, this is all 1949. And Reverend Richard Cartmel, according to Peter Sipoli, served from 1949 to 1957 as the Church of the Messiah. And this is him. Now, the best picture. Of, of, the, of the whole collection is the next one. I'm going to try to read all the names. He took this picture. It's labeled 1949, the Children's Choir at the Messiah. And, he, and thanks to Peter Sipley and others, I got all the names. And we're going to start, I'll take my arrow. This is Gene Ruge. This is Donald Sandy Williams. Looks just like he does today. Amazing. This is Doreen Traver. 
We move to the second row. This handsome devil is our very own former mayor, Peter Sipoli. Next to him is May Asher, Carol Conklin, Jan Merriweather, Margaret Conklin, and this handsome young boy, first time ever that I've seen him in long pants, is our very own Lou Rugi. And next to Lou is Glenn Stewart. The last row is uh, Mike Strong. I have a lot of pictures of Mike Strong. Brenda Murray, Sally Merriweather, Connie Bathrick. She owns, she lives in the building and owns some of the stores on Market Street. And Marva Seitz. And then the adults are the choir master, Elsa Wexler Casey. I have a lot of pictures of her playing the organ. And the assistant choir master, Charlotte Traver. Fabulous piece of Rhinebeck's history. Probably the best photo in the whole collection because we know so many of these people. Great picture. Wonderful. I love Frank. Okay, Frank was a guy. I'm a guy. Guys love trains. 1940s were a very critical time. It was the changeover from steam to diesel. And Frank took many pictures of the river and of the trains at the river. This is one of the old steam engines coming up the river in the 1940s. Here's one of the first diesels, New York Central, coming up. And here's a picture of the ferry terminal. Cars lined up to get on the ferry. Now remember, this is a picture in the 1940s and the bridge to Kingston was not built until 1957. If you wanted to go to Kingston, you took the ferry. Okay, here's another picture of the ferry terminal. The ferry came in here, I think, or over there. And here is the ferry coming in with some cars. Here is the, 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 uh, one of the lighthouses on the river and the gas tanks, which are still there in Kingston today. Whoops. And here is, sorry, here is the ferry leaving the terminal. The cars are gone. Here are the tracks, looks different than today. One platform to set of tracks, this set of tracks, this platform and the other set of tracks are gone to build today's parking lot. This is the last picture of the river. And Frank called this a boatload of bricks. It's a little damaged, one of the very few negatives that were damaged. Um, we had a speaker a few years ago that gave a talk about brick making in the Hudson Valley. There were a lot of brickyards in Kingston. And he said that most of the tenements in New York City were built with bricks from Hudson Valley. Even though it's kind of deteriorated, it's still very sharp. Now, there are hundreds and hundreds of pictures of the Dutchess County Fair and the Decoration Day Parade. I'm going to just give you a couple of samples to show you what's in there. Here's the earliest photo of a Decoration Day Parade from 1930s. Here's the President, Secret Service on the running boards. Okay, here's the Rhinebeck Diner. Here are the cadets from Holy Cross School. Our very own Mike Frazier was headmaster for decades of the Holy Cross School. And many of the women commented, ah, when they were young girls, they thought that these boys were the handsomest boys in town. And they love it. They're always so perfectly best dressed. And there are many pictures of them over the years in the various parades. And here, of course, is the Pocahontas coming down, being towed by a Jeep. Is the SO station, is the Beak. And uh, the SO is, of course, the parking lot for Forsters today. And it wouldn't be complete without the Rhinecliffe Fire Department coming down Route 9. And it's a shaper store before the fire. So that's just a few. There, are, there must be 50 or 100 pictures of parades. The fair, okay. Um, interesting. This was a picture, Edward Berry Mushrooms and Bald Mountain Farms. Now, apparently... They had a parade to the fair to kick off the start of the fair. They had band in one of the, in the back of this thing. And when they got there, the judge 
looking very serious at the various teams, judging which team of horses and get the blue ribbon. Interesting. A lot of pictures of this horse racing. They have horse racing and trotters. This is the outer track. This is the inner track, which they eventually had. It was the Rhinebeck Speedway. It had car racing on it. Here's a sample of one of the booths inside. We still have booths inside all the buildings today. Reddick Public Nursing, Tommy Thompson Trust. I love the cardboard nurse, the plastic baby, and the plastic mother. Now, Frank, of course, left his church. Lots of, every year is a picture of the Messiah food booth, which everyone said was their favorite place. Turkey, 65 cents. Egg salad, 35 cents. Peanut butter, 10 cents. Every year, picture of the food booth. Here's one of two dozen pictures of the 47 reconstruction of the grandstand and the track. Here are the guys every step of the way building the, building the, the seats, the, grand, the upper stands, fixing the track and steamrolling and, and asphalting the inside track for the cars. It was finished in 1949. Here's a picture of it all done. Grandstand looks beautiful. The charters obviously roll down here. And car racing started in 49. And I have seen um, many pictures of this, but this is the original, Frank's picture, Midget Auto Racing, opening night, Wednesday, September 9th, at the Rhinebeck Speed. But we had a program a few years ago during the car show at the fairgrounds where we went into the history of the Speedway and brought back many of the old drivers. And that video also is up on our website. Now, um, here's a picture of the inside of, oh, wait a minute, sorry. We've been to 150 pictures and um, I, I can't go on. I'm gonna finish with some special pictures. This from the fair is great. They had this at the fair. I guess the uh, they have this at the uh, Bronx Zoo. You can ride around in these. They would drive out to the outer parking lots and bring people to the front entrance. We should bring this back today. Frank was very involved in Holiday Farm, which is today's Astor home. Most of his pictures were taken during the holidays. Here they are, uh, 1950. Here they are sleeping in their dorm rooms today. State law requires every boy has his own room. And here they are on Christmas morning, opening their presents. Lots and lots of pictures of the boys over the years. In the fall of 1950, Frank took 40 pictures of the construction of the high school. I'll give you a couple of samples. Laying the forms for the foundation, the beginnings of the brick walls, pouring the concrete, putting in the rebar, building the walls, and putting up the steel. There are 40 pictures in the set, taken over like six months as the school was slowly constructed. Frank was on the spot, always. Is a great picture inside the Star Institute of the Star Library. I love the tables and the lamps and the books. Beautiful piece of history. And again, quality is fantastic. Here's a great picture. Bring your dog to school day or your pet. I guess they're mostly, mostly dogs. Um, great. And he has every year, to, Frank took a picture of the pet show at the school. Kids lined up with the best pet. 1947 was this picture. Now, if anything happened in Rhinebeck, they called Frank. He calls his British buses on Mill Street. Now, of course, here's his office, Benson Frost and Frank Asher. What they were doing here, advertisement, going, going on their way up to Canada, lunch at the Beekman Arms, I don't know, but Frank ran out of his office, took the picture, British buses on Mill Street. This is Cozine Field, Rhinebeck Airways, 1946 picture in midair. This, of course, is today. This was where the Rhinebeck, Rhinebeck Air Dome began and where um, the elementary school is today. Now we start to get in some war stuff. This is the 1943 picture. Looks pretty normal. Frank, of course, took the school pictures every year. Frank was the photographer for Rhinebeck. 
Looks normal, lots of boys, lots of girls. This is the 1944 class picture, eight boys. They were gone, 18 years old, in the army, Navy, whatever, and you're off to the Pacific or to the Atlantic and the European theater. Here's a 1945 picture, still the same, six boys. And these, this looks like a teacher, I'm not sure, but might be an older boy. But again, mostly girls, they hadn't come back from the war yet. So you can see the war did impact Ryan Beck. And of course, we lost some of these boys and they're on the Doughboy, uh, on a plaque on the Doughboy uh, at, in front of the village parking lot. Speaking of war, is a sad one. It's a copy of a telegram, April 3rd, 1945, to Dr. Barrett Tyler, a physician from the village. The Secretary of War desires me to express his deep regret that your son, Captain Barrett L. Tyler, was killed in action in Luzon, March 1945, a few months before the war ended. And Frank made a copy of it. Here's a fascinating picture. This was a postcard, postcard from Germany to Mrs. George McGowan on Broadway and Red Hook from Robert Howard Clark, January 25th, 1945. Dear mother and George, how are you? I am all right and well and doing fine. I hope you the same. Don't forget to tell me all about yourself and have a good letter for me. Tell grandma that I was asking for love to all Bobby. Now, of course, that's all he could say. He couldn't say, it's really tough here. It's cold. Not a lot of food. We're worried about what's going to happen as the war comes to an end. They wouldn't have, the census would have stopped it. So he was telling his parents, I am alive and well as of January 5th, 1945. Here's the last sad one. This is a portrait that Frank took in May of 1944. It's of Roland Trout, Howie and Jerry Trout's uncle and the brother of their father. And this is 1945, May. He went over over the summer. He was killed a month after he got there in France in September of 1945. This is not a sad picture, but it's school teachers in Jeeps in 1944. No idea what this was about. Something unusual, call Frank, come over and take a picture. And some of the people on Facebook identified some of the teachers in the Jeeps. Again, beautiful picture. This is now an Amoco station, hasn't become one of its many other iterations over the years. And here is, this is one of the hardware store, the blizzard of 1947. If you remember this, I do. I was a young kid. Um, it was just a massive snowstorm that paralyzed the whole New England and New York. And it was the day after Christmas, and Frank was out. There's about 20 photos of all the houses in Rhinebeck buried in snow in the blizzard of 47. And the last few photos, this is 1949, swimming at Crystal Lake. There's lifeguards there. I think this fence was here to stop people from getting too, too close to the waterfall. Here's pictures of the diving board out there and a girl in midair diving and some boys dancing on uh, some kind of float out there. And I'm going to end with my favorite picture. This is Frank, 1943, in his basement darkroom, surrounded by his photo papers and his chemicals. We owe a great deal to both Frank and Jonathan Asher. He's taken us through a time machine back 80 years in Rhinebeck history. He's captured Rhinebeck as it was during and after World War II. A much simpler time without iPhones and iPads, where kids swam in Crystal Lake in the summer, painted Halloween windows on the storefronts, and brought their pets to school. Of all of my years with the Historical Society, this project was the best ever. And we're working as quickly as we can to get the entire collection, all 2,000 images, up on our website by the beginning of next year. And I hope you've enjoyed the show. I'm going to stop the share. I'm going to go back into gallery view. And uh, I guess I guess we can take questions. I'll turn it over to Mike and Jeff. 
David, that was just spectacular. I'm, I'm stunned at the variety and this uh, just a great views of so much of the history of Rhinebeck. So we have an opportunity here to, uh, well, I, I wanted to make one other comment before taking any questions. I see that there's somebody in the audience, uh, Jonathan Asher, who I wanna call attention to because Jonathan is the grandson of Frank Asher. And it's because of Jonathan Asher that we have this collection. David was able to spend all the time that he was with it. Uh, Jonathan, I'm glad to finally see who you are. We've, we've exchanged emails and correspondence um, and glad you're able to participate in this evening's uh, program. The, uh, the wealth of these photo negatives is just amazing. And what David has shared with us this evening is it just frankly just scratches the surface of just a magnificent treasure for all of us. Well, I'll, uh, I, I, first of all, let me acknowledge that uh, my sister Sarah is also on this. Uh, so the two of us are looking at our grand one of our grandfather's work and and I'm just stunned. I, I have to say, David, uh, an amazing job that you've done. Um, it doesn't the 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 small amount of work that I did to kind of order the envelopes to get them to you compared to what you've done and the narrative that you've provided. I've I've actually seen people that were old when I knew them that. Um, Young and I mean Elsa Casey, I I didn't recognize her, but the minute you said the name, I went, oh my goodness! So uh, a real trip down memory lane for for me, and I know that uh, Sarah and I would both first of all thank you and Michael. Yes, you've you and I have exchanged some great emails, and thank you for all your good work in that regard. I I know that my grandfather and my father would be thrilled at what you've done and all the incredible work and the the, uh, the, the finding the names of people that uh, I sure wouldn't have known. So uh, great job and thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan. It, it, it was a labor of love on the part of, well, David especially, obviously. And, uh, you know, he explained at the beginning what the process was. I mean, we we received this box from Jonathan that was just packed with these envelopes and we these negatives. And as uh, David started to scan them, he would call us over and say, "Hey, you've got to see this." Uh, and these are just uh, really stunning. And and David's been at it. Uh, you know, the amount of time. Uh, I, I, I don't know that David kept any kind of record of how many hours he's put into this, but uh, it's, really, it's really the history of Rhinebeck in the 1940s and 1950s. And, uh, you know, even though we had uh, a good number of uh, images from Frank Asher uh, before this, since many of them, he was a photographer for, that, uh, for the Gazette newspaper and many of his images uh, have appeared in the Gazette over that period. Uh, but nonetheless, to, to see this additional uh, part of the collection, this, this enormous collection, wow, we're, we're really happy about this. I'm glad to be able to share it with everyone. And David, you've, thank you for the job you're doing that you've done to organize these and present a selection of them in a way that makes sense to all of us. So if yeah. there are uh, specific questions or comments that folks have, uh, please unmute yourself and uh, go for it. Yeah, and, and as a reminder, you can, uh, if you have your camera on, just wave your hand and we'll call on you. Otherwise you can go to the bottom of your screen, click on reactions and raise your hand. Um, and I, uh, David, do you have a chat that came to you? 
Uh, I don't know. There is there is one here. Maybe I'll read it to you, David. It may make. It Sorry, that is that the que the question. From... Yes, Oliver, go ahead. Sorry, I it, there was a prompt to put them in the chat, so I did that. Yeah, I'm uh, in between the time I typed the question. Um, and, and right after you mentioned that um, he was a photographer for the paper also, which I didn't realize. And my, my question was what the purpose of, you know, what his motivation was taking the pictures other than the insurance photos, which obviously were, uh, it's obvious why he took those. But, you know, I was curious if he had historical record keeping in mind. Um, and I guess I didn't, hadn't, realize if you'd mentioned earlier that he was a newspaper photographer. So I guess that would be the answer to that question. Yes. But those 300 envelopes had all the writing on it, it but it was hard. It, it was an envelope with 20 portraits in it, sitting in his chair. And I didn't know who these people were. And I was able to post it on Rhinebeck Past and Present. And so many, but that's my grandfather. That's my uncle. And they were able to add family albums, pictures on their mantelpiece. We were able to piece things together. Yes. He owned this store. He did that. And I put it in the spreadsheet. And we have a, a college intern, Gene, who's working on it now, try to make the uh, descriptions better and more searchable so you can look at the 2,000 pictures in some kind of organized way, like the fair, parades, stores, you know, categories. We can look at all the stores and have a descriptions of them so you can take your own tour. This is 150. This wasn't even... 5% of the collection. So I, I think it's, I'm sorry. I, I think it's also true, Oliver, that Frank had a sense of history and came from a, the, the Asher family goes back. Originally it was spelled E-S-C-H-E-R mm -hmm. and they went back to the origins of Rhinebeck uh, it was a family that had a long track record in the community, um, and they, um, you know, he he had a sense of how he fit into that history and wanted and and understood the importance of documentation. I mean, not just because he was an insurance agent and a very successful insurance agent. Uh, but also because he knew the people that he was working with. He knew the families that they came from. Um, you know, his, uh, his own father, uh, as I said, was, came from a family that had been here many generations. Um, you know, his, his mother's family uh, was, uh, I, I believe if I, I have this accurately, was a strong, uh, and that family had been, uh, were, continued to be involved in the Gazette and several generations of the strong family uh, were uh, the publishers, owners of the uh, Rhinebeck Gazette. And uh, he, he just, uh, you know, I, I think the answer to your question is that he knew what was happening in this community needed to be recorded in some fashion. And it was, it fell to him. He felt a responsibility to do that. Well, I'm glad. It was really, it was a great presentation. Just so much fun to see, like, try to uh, so, you know, some stuff just jumps out at you instantly as being recognizable, and some stuff my brain just can't picture where it is. And oh, well, stores it. change, they're changing today. I'm on the yeah, planning board, is. and we have people coming Tuesday night to that store moved out, and this store is moving in. The stores changed dozens of times over 80 years. The businesses, are, and there's a lot of stores were lost to build those parking lots. You know, I just, I wonder why if Jonathan has any idea why Frank didn't want anybody to smile in there. It was a smile, you know, say, geez. No, they're all like dead serious. Nobody smiled. Three or 400 portraits. Nobody I, you smiled. know, David, I, I'm a, I collect old photography and uh, thousands and thousands of pictures. And you don't really see people in any photographs smiling until really in, into the 60s in some ways. I mean, in, in the early days, it was because the film just wasn't fast enough 
you know, people really had to sit still. And it was also the photograph was meant as a document. It wasn't meant as a kind of um, moment in time or something. It was just meant to say, I, I was here, you know, sit in the chair, come as you are, dress like you work, we'll document you. And I think the idea of smiling for a camera was something that really came in with disposable cameras and, and when photography became almost more of a social activity. Uh, is, is my impression from the I noted that is some of the pictures were of the parade, especially a little blurry, because he mm -hmm. didn't have the cameras didn't have fast lenses at the time. Yeah. And I guess a lot of the good ones were when they stopped, you know, the parade start and stop. He got the he knew enough to take the picture when it stopped. So you would get a clear picture and right. really blurry. But mm -hmm. the but the quality uh, it's just 80 years. It's just because they're so big. Right. That, um, and by the way, somebody commented, this is the 1942 Decoration Day Parade um, and a fire engine over my shoulder as my background. What a I what a Kurt, treasure of photographs. And, and, and just a reminder, um, if anybody else wants to speak, unmute your mic and uh, join in. Let's get that mic in place. Actually, smiling, if, uh, sometimes you watch old movies, you can you can pick up things and my my favorite comedy team, Laurel and Hardy, there's one scene where they've gone to jail and the guy's having his, his Stanley's having his picture taken and Oliver says, uh, smile. Okay, so it does go back, even though uh, as we, some of us remember, the, the, the formality increases the further back you go. Uh, we all used to dress just to get on a train or an airplane years ago. Now, what I find interesting about this collage of pictures is that it it could have been any place, and uh, I I grew up in Long Island, and uh, it doesn't seem a whole lot different uh, the the ambience than, than what I recall. And what's what's most interesting is when you uh, if you're old enough to remember this stuff, you're in a sense you you kind of, and and you're involved in today. And not not people, not all people uh, our age are that involved. Uh, but you kind of like have your your feet in in two worlds. Uh, one one says I I remember and understand and recall all this and the and the sentiments and the and the attitudes and the ambience. And the other is uh, today and, and all of the technology and what have you. It's a uh, it's a bit interesting to to see things in, in in that respect so while while i have no personal experience of rhinebeck per se in in those days uh it it does seem pretty generic it was life during and after the war it was uh the kids and of course i love that he was the school photographer of course frank did everything and you could see the, the 44 and 45 how the kids were gone and uh, the war did affect Ryan Beck and affected everybody in the country. Okay. Any any additional questions or comments before we shut down for the evening? Um, I'll work on the video tomorrow and get it up by Sunday on a website. It's really easy to Zoom videos are done. Just put a title on it, upload it to YouTube. I'll send out a notice to everyone, um, on, on our members, on friends, on Facebook, and say the video's up if anybody wants to take a look at it. And we'll send an announcement out in the spring as soon as we get database created and Mike has to get it into our database and our webmaster has to get it up on the website. And uh, 2,000 images will, will be great. A great addition to our collection. Great. John, John Vincent, I see you're unmuted. Did you want to say something? We, we can't hear you, John. We can't hear you, John. You know, you're well, yeah, you're mute. You were it's showing as unmuted before, but you're muted now. I guess his microphone's not working. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyone else have a question? If if not, um, I mean, it doesn't sound like there are any more questions or comments. So, David, again, many many thanks for all your labors on this, Jonathan. Thank you for donating what is a real, real treasure for us and to all of our audience for joining us this evening. And so I'm going to call the 
program concluded. And again, thanks everybody for joining us.